Cool. So welcome to this conversation. So today I'm joined with uh, Siddharth, who is in indoor in India. And I will quickly go over like what we're going to be talking about, although you may have got it from the title. Um, so uh, Siddharth and I got in contact because he'd recently done um, something that I actually don't know too much about, but what I understand to be like a training for um, being an activist or understanding antinatalism, um, which I actually don't know if there is any there is any training that's ever happened on like how to be an antinatalist activist. I, there, there might be, and I might even know about it, and I'm just like being ignorant right now. But I think this may be the first one, but... Um, yeah. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. So I wanted to have like a conversation with you. Um, but before we get into that, I wondered if you could just like give an introduction to yourself and also let everyone know, like, how did you originally become an antinatalist and you're vegan as well? So yeah, could you give a bit of an introduction? Right, right. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, in this interview, Lawrence, uh, and uh, I'm Siddharth Dafaria. I hail from Indore. And just to give a background, I am a lawyer and also a management postgrad. And uh, it, I was 13 years old and I was uh, uh, going through some... Um, at that time, I used to be uh, quite religious. And I was going through some uh, religious books. And uh, it all said that uh, liberation is when you don't enter into the cycle of birth and death that is being liberated. So mm. uh, I asked my mom who, who was sitting next to me, I asked her that, then what's the point of giving birth if the best thing that could happen to you is not to be reborn? And uh, she didn't have an answer. I went to uh, the saint uh, called this, I'm a, I'm a Jain, I follow Jain, is like I'm born into a Jain family, I would say. So mm. the religious saint, I went to him and asked him about it. They gave certain answers. I went to some other religious saint. They gave some other answers. So ultimately, n none of the answers satiated me. So I came to the conclusion that uh, nobody really, really has any particular idea. It made me think that, okay, you, you come, you grow old someday and you die and the cycle repeats. So it didn't make sense to me. And around that time, a thought came in my, in my mind that I would never reproduce. I, would, I will never have a kid. With time, it just uh, grew stronger when I got to know mm. um, how the world is, the sufferings of this world, the injustices of the world, and uh, really uh, the pointlessness of uh, these things. Although it was clear to me that since I'm already here, I'll endeavor to live a good life, a happy life, uh, do good things, and, uh, but not to procreate. Because that's in my hand, not to bring more people. My existence was not in my hand in the first place. So that's all right. I'll, I'll have fun. I'll, mm -hmm. ha I'll do good things. I'll contribute, but n not procreate. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's super interesting. I actually don't know if I've spoken to anyone who's sort of come to antinatalism through Jainism. Um, in fact... I think I've only knowingly met one Jane in my life and it was when like several years ago I hiked uh, Kilimanjaro, which is a mountain in, in Africa. Hmm. And there was a guy who was a Jane on that hike and I spoke to him a bit about it. But okay. um, back then I, I wasn't antinatalist. So, you know, I couldn't ask him about that. Um, but just out of interest, when you were like discussing this idea maybe you didn't know the word antinatalist at this point but yeah. like when you were discussing this idea with with Jane's were they at all like open-minded about it or were they quite dismissive uh I would say none of the people who are religious uh have uh, ever taken antinatalism uh very uh, with, with, a, with an open heart uh be it Jain or Hindus or Muslims or any anyone for that matter uh but there is this one thing uh, about Jains that I have observed, although I'm an, I'm an atheist, but uh, since I have access to, to community members, I frequently go and talk about veganism. Uh, along with that, I've also started talking about, about antinatalism. So at least mm -hmm. uh, due to ahinsa, that is called nonviolence, uh, it is 
one of the most important tenet in this particular religion so they at least try to understand this although they have a strong resistance uh one of the reasons that they uh they have is the overall population declining uh, the overall fertility rate uh, plummeting like from 5 million uh, 20 years back to 3.5 million in 2024 so uh, almost it's diminishing at a very high rate the the jain population in the world so there is a strong resistance towards antinatalism mm so yeah right yeah 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 no that's um that's that's interesting yeah so um let's let's move on to um your like more, more towards the the thing that we're here to talk about like the training but before we actually get to that specifically um i wanted to ask cuz i saw on your social media that you've kind of got like a bit of a like an antinatalist community or at least group in indoor yeah. yeah um and i wondered like um what is that what is that community or group like like how did you guys find each other what do you guys do um all that sort of stuff yeah so uh, we do have a community of 30 odd people here um basically i i i, I turned vegan a couple of years back and uh, i got into the community and started activism and in the community meetups i used to talk i started talking about antinatalism i i i happened to come across uh, uh, dr david benatar's better never to have been i read that two years back and mm. got to know about this term antinatalism although i have always been like since like last 17 odd years i have uh, i've decided not to procreate but got mm. to know about the term the different arguments the rebuttals and all these things two years back so i made it a point that whenever i go to any meetups community meetups i talk about this so slowly i started uh, taking note of the people who have uh, uh, their uh, interest in this particular ideology and they have you know interest in activism related to antinatalism and soon formed a group of these people and last year started activism started instagram page uh, that goes by the name your saintly devil where i create content small uh, short reels and posts on antinatalism and mm. so that's how we started nurturing this community majorly bringing people uh, almost i think 85 to 90% people are vegans as well because they come from that community although we do have other people who are not vegans uh but who share our values and so yeah uh mm. majorly the activism that we do is online also started with street activism that we have recently done uh, mm. one of the things that i uh, personally felt was we needed a certain uh, structure to the arguments that we make in public the standard rebuttals that we would be giving to people because many people become antinatalist because of certain reasons and some become from philanthropic reasons some become from misanthropic reasons what whatever reasons they have but once they get to know about all the different arguments they will have a good arsenal to their access so whenever they go to you know this they speak with a person randomly on the street they will have different uh, arguments to give different rebuttals to, to their counter arguments so that's how it came to my mind that before every activism uh, outreach i will give a short 30 minutes or 20 minutes of uh, a training session so that's how it all right. started yeah so so you so when you say before each outreach you would give like a training session yeah. would you like find cuz the so the the video that i initially saw was you in what seemed like some sort of like classroom yeah. or something like this yeah um and there seemed like people of all ages there yeah. so was this was that video of that training you were given was that one of the ones before an outreach or was this an independent larger one yeah so we all gathered there uh I I I gave the training session and after that we went to the uh, a marketplace in Indore where there are a lot of people mm. who come to eat food to just stroll by and there we did the activism so first we gathered mm. in a in a in an office area office setup where there was a a, a board and you know yeah. all the facilities for training and 
after that we went to that activism place yeah. So, and because so in the video you can see a few of the people who came along and there, there was like a, a massive range of uh ages there there were um i think like right in front of the camera there was some children and then there were also some people who i mean i don't want to guess their age because i don't want to offend them but they were like old, older than children shall we yeah. say yeah. um so yeah ha, were, were all of those people involved in the activism or did people bring their families along or who who was who was the audience so basically uh there was a lady there um with her children and she she's a vegan but after i met her i talked to her about uh the arguments in favor of antinatalism and she's pretty much uh, also agrees to all the, uh, the agrees to, with the philosophy so she right. she came with her children and she wishes uh, that her children also uh, listen to those arguments and uh, uh, have th- those values in them now since she was not uh, exposed with the philosophy of antinatalism mm. she but but now that she is convinced of it she she brings her children and there was a gentleman who was sitting in front um, he he gave the office premises for uh, this this training session and right. although he too has uh, a couple of kids and he is also a vegan but but now that he supports the philosophy of antinatalism he is doing his best to give the resources uh, so that we can propagate this philosophy yeah mm. no that that's great like um you know i think it's it's amazing that some people are open minded enough yeah. that their parents but at the same time you know they can take they can sort of um change their mind on something which you know they may feel is attacking them which obviously you know antinatalism is not attacking parents but mm. um it can be it can be perceived that way yes. um right. yeah so that that that's really cool um so in terms of like the training itself and what you went over because you were saying that you wanted to like formalize the way that you sort of present arguments to people so like what exactly do you go over in your trainings and has it changed over time because you've done multiple now yeah so basically uh, last year when we were doing activism on the street uh, we we felt a need that uh, we didn't have a common uh, shared argument structure and we also had some people who got heated up not the activists but the people with whom we were talking to so i wanted to you know reorient everyone so mm. in the training i i always uh, start off uh, with telling everybody that our goal is not to you know satisfy our uh, egos by convincing somebody right mm. there then and there our target audience is not everyone we'll speak with people for a minute or two and we'll give our time to people who are open minded enough who are rational enough to take yeah this new philosophy for them which is new for them and somebody on the fence who is already you know of a mindset who is rational we will we'll speak them for for further duration but not more than that also uh, with with that amount of empathy in us that people are conditioned uh, not just socially conditioned especially uh, in a in a country like india where uh, it, it's it's a highly theistic high, highly religious uh, uh, population uh, also where a country where uh, parents are looked up to as a god like figure and uh, psychologically speaking nobody would want to consider something wrong what their parents have done so considering mm-hmm. becoming an anti natalist also means that the person believes that their parents have done something wrong or immoral mm. so uh plus uh genetically conditioning genetic conditioning that since billions of years the the evolution how how the primordial urge of every being to reproduce to proliferate their genes it is there in all of us so having that empathy we have to go speak politely keep our point straight and and disengage at the mm. moment we feel it's getting heated up or it's unsafe at that point yeah so this so is how what what do you yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry go on no yeah please that that, that was my point yeah so i i was just going to ask like when you i so i assume now after these events you've spoken to quite a few people right yeah. um like on on the street 
what do you find is the um the best way to communicate antinatalism to them do you feel like there's a certain way of framing it or a certain argument how's the how have you found is the best way so far to talk to people about it yeah so uh in the two types of activisms that i have done uh, one is uh, one that i do regularly veganism and antinatalism one thing that i have observed is in the antinatalist uh, arguments or the the activism people themselves approach us more often than not when when they read the posters and if they are just standing by and the outreacher would approach them and ask them that did you find something interesting or do you want to talk about it they mm. themselves would give points that okay why do you think having kids is wrong why do you think it is immoral uh, they would 9 out of 10 times they would initiate the argument mm. um, what i have done or what i have been practicing which maybe i, I will evolve with time or when i when i you know when we experiment and with trial and error if we find something better i would definitely adopt mm. that uh, but currently i straight away tell people that uh, we are trying to speak with people on the street that reproduction or reproducing is immoral it's wrong and once i say that they themselves come with uh, this why why do you think that and mm. then i straight straight away get to the point that that because this is a world f- uh, full of suffering we we don't it's a gamble we don't know what will happen to the, to the kid some of the sufferings mm. will be inevitable like death heartbreak or disease or old age and some of the other sufferings could be excruciating that we don't know of that will occur to them mm. at the same time if you don't have them you'll save them from all these sufferings but they won't be missing out on the good aspects because they won't they are, they are not depri- they are not being deprived because they do not exist and deprivation yeah, is a yeah. factor of existence right you don't exist you won't be deprived of anything so this is the mm. opening statement of the philanthropic aspect of antinatalism once i say once i talk about it they themselves come come with a lot of arguments so in the training it's all about those arguments that they will give and the rebuttals that we have for those arguments that mm. is what the training was about yeah and um you know i've kind of um if i'm understanding what you're saying correctly like i've kind of had the same experience with the contrast between vegan outreach and antinatalist outreach in that um whenever i've done vegan outreach most of the people um they already have like some sort of opinion baked into their head yeah. um uh, and and often yeah they will stop and 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 look at you and you you have to go and approach them but what i found with antinatalist activism or outreach is that it's actually a bit different like you said in that i think because people are just like je- often when someone sees someone you know condemning procreation or saying stop having kids they see it as such a strange and bizarre thing that they're kind of just curious about it rather than hating it like don't get me wrong i'm sure you've had this experience and i've had this experience sometimes yeah. sometimes you'll get someone come up to you and maybe they've already seen antinatalism on the internet mm. and and they already hate it or maybe they just have a visceral reaction obviously sometimes you get people who have really bad reactions but mm. my like genuine experience has been that most people even if they disagree are just genuinely curious about why do you believe this yeah. because it's quite a um like most you know most people even if they haven't thought deeply about veganism they at least recognize that there's a conversation around the moral status of animals yeah. but most people haven't even considered the fact that there is a discussion to be had around the moral status of procreation so i think mm. they often come at it with a with a fresher pair of eyes than they would with veganism true that that's right uh plus it is so much ingrained in uh, every uh, human being uh especially uh, since i have interacted only with people uh, here in india about antinatalism there is so much uh, glorification and a divinity attached with life and with giving birth and the status mm. of uh, the god like image of uh, parents that they they take it personally like a personal attack on them 
that how could you even raise a poster saying that uh, procreation is immoral how dare you do that mm. it's it's that they, it's that a, like a personal attack they take uh, that those posters uh majorly it's uh, the, the religious uh, fabric which which considers that there is a there's a divine being who created all of this so uh, the the natural consequence of that uh, chain of thought is that whatever they create will also be divine and since that divine character produced everybody so you giving birth you are not the creator you are just an instrument who brought mm. that baby in the world and if that yeah. baby is created by a divine entity there must be a plan a grand scheme of plan behind it so all suffering is meaningful now right they they consider everything is has a meaning they they will come up with all sorts of arguments like karma or uh, uh, some consequentiality destiny or what not just to just to uh, keep that particular conclusion intact they first came up with an with the conclusion and then they back calculated all those arguments it was not something what which came up with logic the conclusion came first which they were fed since their childhood uh, and then came the logics or not even logic those arguments or the reasons so called reasons mm. yeah it's it's um it's it's kind of the same with uh, especially with the religious uh, angle um at speaker's corner we have a place in london called speaker's corner where it's got a history of like debate and people go there specifically to debate topics and it's very um dominated by religious discussion particularly um around islam there's a lot of like uh, muslim preachers that are there um and i've i've been there a few times with a with an antinatalist group we have here in london and um one of the things that i've heard from them is is the same as what you're saying you've heard from religious people as well yeah. i don't know if it was muslims who you spoke to or if it was a different uh, religious group but um yeah they would say that actually it wasn't your parents who created you it was god who created you, yeah, you yeah. and and your parents were merely the vehicle you know um which you know i'm sure they genuinely believe that um but to me it seems like a cheap get out clause to avoid the responsibility of yeah. your own actions yeah so i tend to say to them like look okay even if you ultimately believe that god creates children like the parents can still choose to procreate or not right they can still choose whether they want to be willing vehicles yeah. um and yeah they generally tend to then accept that of like okay yeah parents do have a choice you know they can choose to be vehicles for god's creation um but yeah, i just found it interesting that you know you're on like you know halfway around the world and people use the same um you know I don't know if it's a conscious way of avoiding responsibility for your actions. Maybe it's just subconscious or it's just, you know, it's just a genuine belief they have, but it's just interesting that you came across the same thing. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, the the logic is just extended. I mean, uh they, they would go on arguing about the books that they have read, very conveniently ignoring the sensory evidence that they have like with eyes they could see the suffering. Mm. while igno- while uh latching on to the logic or the reasons that they have read in a book i i usually tell people uh, since at some point i i have been religious and i have read books i i do tell people uh that there is a lot of uh, incongruence and um dissimilarities between the same religion i mean in in hinduism for example there are six school of thoughts six philosophies related with rebirth soul transmigration of soul uh, karma uh, same with jainism buddhism in abrahamic religions as well so there is no one way of looking at things then how could just by chance you were born in a particular household you were mm. told a story how could you be so sure that this is the only right thing when yeah. your neighbor had you been just born in your neighbor's house or some other city or some other part of the world you would be buying you you would be having some other notion of existence mm. these are all uh, at the end of the day just you know 
ways of making meaning out of this uh, randomness whereas mm. if you just open your eyes and look look around you would yourself know the suffering and the pointlessness of it so this is usually what i try to tell people yeah and do you um when you're doing your outreach uh do you do you have any materials with you so i know you have signs um but do do you have any form of like leaflets or cards that you use at all uh currently we only have posters uh we are trying uh, like the next time that we do we will do it with good quality audio equipment so that we can shoot uh, content for our videos and reels oh that's and good yeah yeah also get some cards printed which 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 will have resources some good uh, videos names of some good creators like yours uh, so oh, thank you yeah so we'll we'll have we'll, we're planning to do that yeah Oh cool. And um do you plan to um well like what what language slash languages do you do you plan to do that in? Uh primarily we use English and Hindi because uh most most of the people uh are averse with with they are well aware of English and they're comfortable mm. in that as well as uh, a lot of people who are uh, uh, not so well versed in English they they speak in Hindi. So yeah, both the languages mm. I would say they work well. Yeah. Yeah, and I I would definitely encourage you to to capture video and audio in um in both languages because mm. I mean obviously you know it's good to have it in English because you know it's a very very widely spoken language mm. um but also you know sometimes I think English gets too much attention and mm. it's good to have stuff in other languages as well so it'll be amazing to have some um footage in in Hindi as well absolutely. Um, yeah we, and we do, have, do you, yeah. oh sorry go on yeah uh, i was i was uh, i was saying that yeah you you're absolutely right because uh, we have a huge uh, hindi speaking population in india and a lot of people who are in tier 2 and tier 3 cities they are more comfortable in consuming content in hindi as compared to uh, the english language so yeah that that's a good suggestion yeah mm and um what what sort of stuff so you've you've already said that like in the future you know you want to um start recording stuff are there any other things that you want to do in the future at some point any plans you have in in terms of like different forms of activism or expanding the the social group or linking up with other groups you know what what sort of plans if any do you have for the future yes Uh, definitely i think uh, collaborating with uh, fellow activists and different groups it it would it can work uh, very nicely because there would be collaborative learning we would uh, we would be able to share our training material and what arguments rebuttals that we give we will get to know how they plan their activism what different are they doing so yeah definitely i i would want to collaborate uh, in fact in different part of like in the southern part of the country there's a city called pune where tejas is also based in uh, there were mm. a few activists uh, who wanted to get the training material so i recorded the audio and i sent them uh, the training module oh so, that's great yeah so definitely uh, when it comes to activism i would also want to um, increase the online presence i mean like like you are very regular uh, in posting videos and the content so i was also planning to shoot some short reels for instagram about different arguments of different pro natalist arguments and their rebuttals like one one minute mm. of reels and posting them on my instagram uh, channel or uh, instagram page and also to start uh, a youtube channel and post it on youtube as well mm Yeah no that would that would be amazing and it's um it's cool that like the different groups in India are starting to um sort of link up you know because there there do seem to be like a, f- a few different groups around India obviously um you you're you're aware of and I'm sure a lot of the people um who are watching are aware of um uh summit's group bengali antinatalists they yeah. you know they they do quite a lot of stuff and i've had yes. him on the channel a couple of times now um mm-hmm. and we've spoken about things that um that they've done they mm-hmm. um you know what one one like interesting thing they did was um they they went to a book fair and were handing out free antinatalist books or booklets um uh-huh. 
so that that's quite interesting that you know they like took an event that was happening in the city and um or happening in a city and and sort of like used it to their advantage um mm -hmm. which uh yeah is quite um is quite interesting but it's it's cool that the the groups are sort of slowly trying to uh uh slowly linking up and hopefully um when he's less busy Tejas will be able to do something with the group in uh in Pune where he lives Sounds interesting I mean uh, this is actually a good uh idea to you know uh, give some free books or give some ebooks i also uh, plan to uh, do this actually i do have the ebook of uh, one of the uh, one of the ebooks of antinatalism and i do share it with people whenever mm -hmm. some i find i find somebody who is you know interested in this particular uh, particular topic but yeah definitely this this thing that sumit has uh, tried out i would try to replicate that in indore where 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 i live mm. and I, i hope it would work nicely yeah 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 um you you also wanted to talk about uh euthanasia was this about like the state of euthanasia in in the state that you're in or in india as a whole or what did you want to discuss uh i mean this is a very contentious topic here in india mm. because uh, because of the religious beliefs and uh, most of the uh, religions here uh, hinduism and islam they they consider they look down upon uh, euthanasia although uh, my perspective uh, is that although somebody has come without their consent at least they they have they should have the right to a dignified exit a painless exit mm -hmm. uh, be be it because of any reason any terminal illness or old age or mental health or any particular reason that they feel um uh, is justified for them so so yeah in india currently we we don't have uh any provision related with active euthanasia it is mm. uh it is illegal here there's a very tedious process to get to get uh, passive euthanasia um so yeah a lot of uh, i i think there are five countries in europe uh, as far as i i know which do have uh, provisions related with active euthanasia mm. and a few can states just, yeah just just um for anyone that doesn't know can you explain the difference between active and passive euthanasia yeah so active euthanasia is uh is basically when a person chooses to be to to die uh painlessly mostly uh with the, with the assistance of a medical professional uh it is called active euthanasia it is the person who's assisting they uh press the button or they 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 initiate the process that's how it is different from assisted suicide passive euthanasia is basically when uh, a, there is a patient who is suffering from may maybe terminal illness or uh, some other medical uh, disorder or medical uh, condition mm. and uh, the life support maybe ventilator or any other life support is removed and as an eventuality they die that is called passive euthanasia mm. yeah and do you think that there is any hope for So in in India because India is a federal system, right? You have different states. Yeah, we we do I have, don't Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know how the system works in India, but would it be would it be within the right of the state to legalize euthanasia in a specific state or would it have to be done federally? Is it everywhere or nowhere or can individual states do it? No, uh in India as against like it's exactly opposite to how it's in the US here it's the union uh, the central government uh, that that will pass the laws for the entire country right. uh, all the major laws are a prerogative of uh, the union and not the individual states so this has to come from the central government and right. uh, looking at the fabric of the social fabric currently it seems very difficult that uh, this is going to happen anywhere soon uh, yeah yeah it's a uh, i i don't i wouldn't say there's any uh, political party which is of that particular uh, mindset 
that would allow or that would push a, a bill in the parliament uh, yeah. to legalize active euthanasia not because uh, they lack the political will but because uh, it would be going against the religious uh, psyche of yeah. the majority of the population so yeah yeah no i i i get it like um in in the uk we i actually i might be getting this wrong but my understanding is that actually the government is is behind where the people are i think actually the 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 uk population is more supportive of euthanasia than the actual government is or the the um members of parliament that we have the politicians okay. um so it could be and we've just had a change of government as well. So we've, mm -hmm. we've got now the Labour Party come in who are considered, you know, the more sort of left wing um, political party in the UK. Okay. And um, I think they might have said, I might be getting this wildly wrong, but I think they said that they would permit a free vote on assisted dying if they got in. Okay. Um, so we might see a free vote on assisted dying in the UK sometime in the next sort of, you know, four or five years. Um, but the, the, the UK is a, is, is, um, is a lot less religious than India um, sure. in, in my, yeah, my, my um, perception. Like we still have an official state religion. You know, obviously we still have a monarchy and religion is involved in that. Um, but in terms of like how religion it, religion doesn't really impact politics here anymore um mm. politics is is pretty much secular um which i i think is is for the better um yeah. and it, it that means that we don't have the same barriers that you would in india True. um having to get over people's religious sensitivities right, um right. you know yeah yeah mm. i i hope uh, soon enough you can get a uh, uh, favorable law passed in uk uh, mm. because in india i don't think anywhere soon uh, anytime soon this will happen uh, mm. yeah 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 well i mean we can but hope um but um was there anything else you wanted to talk about in regards to uh the antinatalist work you've done or, or the training specifically before we round off yeah, uh, one of the things that I've observed uh, among people uh, while talking about antinatalism is they kind of think of it in a very uh, negative light. When when they hear about mm. it, they, they tend to get depressed and sad uh, because uh, a natural thing which happens, like uh, it's about our cognition, human cognition. Whenever a concept comes to it, it takes on its own self that concept. If I tell a layman about antinatalism, they would immediately try to think of their own inexistence. Mm. Uh, forgetting that now your mind is already in existence. Your mind has its own pleasure points, suffering points, its attachments. Thinking about inexistence will not rewire you in a way that you would think of it from the scratch. You would think as if you have been taken out right now. Exactly, and you're yeah. missing out on your loved ones. So one thing that I tell people is do not consider yourself inexistent right now. The way that you could imagine in existence is to consider your inexistent sibling. For example, if I have one brother, mm. if I think about my second brother uh, who is inexistent, who does not exist, is he missing out on anything? No, he's not because no, he's, he's inexistent. But is he being saved from the short, short suffering of this this world, this existence, yes, he's being saved, definitely. So this is one of the things that uh, I tell people. This analogy basically helps them imagine in existence and the positives, the net positives of in existence. Exactly, yeah. Like people make this mistake all the time about imagining themselves being taken out of existence rather than never coming into it, yeah. which I can understand, right? Because it's like we're apes that evolved to you know recognize what was edible and what wasn't and you know um like navigate relationships in in small societies that we had or small groups so it's like mm -hmm. it's understandable that it's not massively intuitive to us to think about non-existent people who could mm -hmm. have existed right so cool. I, I i can completely understand it um the thing i often say to people is um and i i got this from my friend john i think 
um, like asking the person, you know, 200 years ago, they didn't exist. And it wouldn't even make sense for me to ask them, how was that year for you? Because there wasn't a them for the year to be anything. You know, they were just non-existent. It wasn't a bad year because they were missing out on existence. It wasn't a good year. You know, it was just, it wouldn't, it doesn't even make sense. It's not a coherent question to ask, how was the year for you? True. Um, yeah. And so if they never existed, that would be th then for them, it would be how now is if they never existed, you know, they just simply wouldn't exist. Um, yeah. And, and maybe another way of putting it as well is that, um, you know, when you're considering, uh, creating someone there is, you know, well, I mean, maybe this isn't talking about the same thing. The thing I was going to say was that often people will say, why do you always focus on the suffering? And I usually say, well, it's because when you're thinking about creating someone, there is no need or desire for good things to take into consideration when you're weighing it against the bad things that will be experienced when they come into existence. Absolutely. So it's like, you've got to, like, all of these harms that they'll experience, what are you weighing them up against? Well, nothing, because there's, there's, there's no one who would desire or need anything, right? Whereas they're, they're analyzing the situation from the point of view of someone who does exist with needs and desires. So they're thinking, well, there is something to weigh it up against. You know, there are these needs and desires. But Absolutely. actually, if you're talking about someone who, who would never exist, it's, it's not the same. Yeah. Absolutely. And even the nature of existence is as such that uh, pleasure and pain are not even comparable. I mean, you would mm. never find somebody walking and smiling and very happy today because something good happened to them three years ago. But you would mm. find people traumatized because something really bad happened to them three years ago. So yeah, yeah. pleasure is invariably very temporary and uh, pain is always daunting and enduring in nature. Grief, heartbreak, mm. all these things. So there's literally no comparison. Yeah, no, no, 100%. Um, cool. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for giving me your time. And also, it's nice to hear about um, like the things you guys are doing in Indore and, and the fact that like different groups in India are now starting to link up. Um, and yeah, I would just, you know, I would be interested if the trainings that you do, you know, expand or they um, develop over time you know, I'd be really interested to hear updates. And also, um, if you ever think of doing one in English, then definitely record it and put that online as well, because there are a lot of, you know, English speakers that would, that could benefit from that, you know, like there are groups in Japan doing this. There are groups in New Zealand, the mm. USA, in the UK as well. Obviously we're doing it. And there's, because of Nimrod's tour, I don't know if you've come across Nimrod before, the guy who did the European tour. Yeah. So there's a few groups starting up around Europe as a result of him doing his tour. So there wow. are many, many people out there that would, you know, benefit from seeing the materials that you've already brought together if they could be put into English. But obviously, I don't want to put any pressure on you. That is your prerogative to do. Um, but it's, it's just it's amazing that you're doing this stuff, regardless of the language that it's in. Thank you so much, Lawrence. And uh, it's a very good idea. In fact, I would start working on it and I would definitely post it. I'll also give you updates on that. And uh, also to uh, a big, big thank you to you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I've been following you since a long time and I've been forwarding your videos to, to the community that we are building in Indore. Oh, thank you. And yeah. a lot of people have benefited from the work that you're doing. And I, I personally feel uh, that in, in this... Uh, randomness of this existence if at all there is something which is meaningful is to spread antinatalism and to stop mm. beings being uh, forced in here so yeah kudos to the work that is being done yeah yeah no 100 percent exactly it's we we have to run around and try and convince people to stop rearranging deck chairs on the titanic and just yes. get them to stop bringing people mm -hmm. onto it right um yeah 100 percent well yeah, thank you so much, Siddharth. And um, I wish you and the community in Indore well for the future. I know you'll do amazing things. Um, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lawrence.